why is there added, he descended into hell. In my greatest sorrows and temptations, I may be assured and comforted that my Lord Jesus Christ, by his unspeakable anguish, pain, terror, and agony, which he endured throughout all his sufferings, but especially on the cross, has delivered me from the anguish and the torment of hell. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, have you ever had the experience where you've had an encounter with someone, and in that moment you're, you're just so caught off guard by their behavior or by something that they have said that you just don't know quite how to respond. But then later, perhaps even a long time later, you suddenly have this, this moment of clarity where you realize oh, that's what I should have said, or oh, that's what I should have done. I suspect that each and every one of us has had that experience from time to time, and this afternoon I'd like to tell you about an occasion when this happened to me. Now, this actually happened quite a few years ago now. At the time, I was teaching a seminar-level class in Reformation history, And since seminar classes are generally smaller classes, this was one of those occasions on which I'd come to know my students quite well. Of course, that also meant that my students had gotten to know me also. And one of the things that my students had come to know about me is that I was a Christian, and they'd come to discover that I was a Christian of a Calvinist persuasion. And from time to time, that provoked a certain amount of discussion particularly when we dealt with difficult topics like predestination. Now, in this particular class, there was, there was one young man who over time made it clear that he was not a particularly big fan of Christianity, and he was particularly unimpressed with the doctrines of Reformed and Calvinist Christianity. Now, sometimes he, he made his sentiments known, he made his opinions known with, in the context of our classroom discussions, but on other times he, he took more passive-aggressive approaches. One of his favorite strategies was to come to class wearing a particular t-shirt. And on that t-shirt that he wore, it was a black t-shirt, and on that t-shirt was a picture of the Grim Reaper. You know, the guy with the hood and the skeletal face and the the scythe in his hand. Well, this was a laughing Grim Reaper. This Grim Reaper had a scythe in one hand, and he had a beer in the other hand, and he had a big smile on his face. And below that, that picture of the Grim Reaper were written a slogan. And the slogan that was written below said this, I would rather party in hell than serve in heaven. I would rather party in hell than serve in heaven. Now, I'm not sure if this young man knew where that quotation came from. It's actually an altered version of a statement that's made by Satan in John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost. In the course of the early parts of that poem, Satan declares that he would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. And I'm not sure if this young man knew how that quotation had been changed. I'm, I'm not sure if he knew where it had come from. But what I am sure of is that he wore that t-shirt in order to provoke a reaction. But the thing is, I was never quite sure. I was never really sure how best to respond to his provocation. I couldn't think of how best to engage with him on this issue. And so the reality is that I, I just didn't. And that has always bothered me. Even years later, I have thought back on those interactions, and I've wondered, what should I have done? What could I have done? What would have been the most profitable, the most beneficial way to to engage with that young man? But many years later, as I was working on a sermon on Lord's Day 16, and particularly when I was thinking about question and answer 44, I finally realized what my response should have been. I finally realized what I should have done. What I should have done is I should have grabbed hold of that man and I should have sat him down and I should have asked him this question. But what if there is no party? 
But what if there is no party? You see, here's the thing about, about the concept of hell in our, in our contemporary society. Most people in the world around us, they don't even believe that hell exists. And that's rather odd because I think if you were to go out into the neighborhood surrounding this church and you were to gather a group of, say, 20 people who just live in and around this neighborhood, if you were to gather 20 random people and you were to ask them, do you believe in heaven? My bet is that the overwhelming majority of them would say that they they do believe that there is some better life, that there is some better place or better state of existence after death. But if you ask those very same people if they believe that hell exists, I would bet money on the fact that the majority of them would insist that it doesn't. And I think that's reflective of the fact that most people in our society, they they tend to think of themselves as being fundamentally good people. They tend to think of themselves as being essentially good. And because they think of themselves as being fundamentally good, They don't really have a sense that they're in need of being saved in any particular way. And because they don't need to be saved, then they think to themselves, well, there's there's really nothing to be saved from. And because they think there's really not much of a chance of them going to hell, they, they have a tendency just to deny its existence altogether. At the same time, however, there does seem to be this odd prevailing notion That if, in fact, hell does exist, that that those who end up there, that they will will experience hell in some sort of communal way. The prevailing sentiment seems to be that the damned will get to spend eternity together. And that they will spend their time raging. Raging against the injustice of it all. Raging against the fact that they've been excluded from heaven. And that was the sentiment that lay behind this this young men's t-shirt. That was the sentiment behind that slogan that I would rather party in hell than serve in heaven. As if to say, well, if in fact hell is real, and if in fact I am barred from entering heaven, then at least I will be stuck together with all of the rebellious cool kids. And those folks know how to have a good time, even if all that they're doing is is raging. And brothers and sisters, this afternoon, I would like to suggest to you that the best way of responding to that view of hell is with the question, but what if there is no party? And I'd like to suggest that a study of question and answer 44, where we confess what we believe and what we mean when we say that Jesus descended into hell, that a study of question and answer 44 can help us to appreciate why that is the right question to ask. Now, the place to begin this afternoon is by acknowledging that hell is, in fact, a real place. Or perhaps it would be better to say this, hell is a real destination. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that hell is real? Well, we know that hell is real because it's spoken of, and indeed it's spoken of frequently in the pages of God's Word. The simple reality is that God tells us about hell. He tells us about its existence. In fact, God tells us about the existence of hell regularly, and he often does so personally. And that becomes clear when we realize that there was no one who spoke more often about the reality of hell than Jesus did. It turns out that during the time of his earthly ministry, Jesus actually had rather a lot to say about hell. And the passage that we read from the Gospel of Mark this afternoon is, is just one example of when he did so. Now, if you were to stop and reflect on that for a moment... It only makes sense that that Jesus spoke regularly about the reality of hell. And it makes sense because of what it is that Jesus had come to do. And what was it that Jesus had come to do? What was Jesus' mission? What was his goal here on earth? Well, Jesus had come proclaiming the gospel. And What is it that lies at the very heart? What is it that lies at the very center of the gospel message? Isn't it the confession 
that by the grace of God, believers have been saved. Right? That's what lies at the very heart of the gospel message, that by the gracious goodness of the living God, we have been saved. Now, what is it that we've been saved from? Well, Paul's very clear about this in his letter to the Romans. What we've been saved from is condemnation. And condemnation is the outpouring of God's wrath. It's the outpouring of God's wrath against the sins of men. And how is it that believers are saved from condemnation? Well, they're saved by the suffering and by the death of Jesus Christ in their place. And what is the consequence of having been saved? Well, the consequence of having been saved by the atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ is that believers are made righteous. And having been made righteous, believers are then given hope. They are given the hope of enjoying the blessing of an eternal life in heaven. And so if we think about it for a moment then, at the heart of the gospel is a promise. The promise of being saved from hell through the cross, with the destination of heaven, and that is precisely the message that the Lord Jesus Christ came proclaiming. Hell, then, is real, and we know that hell is real because God has told us that it's real. And God hasn't just told us that it's real, He's also told us that that for some people, this will be their eternal destination. And that knowledge raises a question. Well, who is hell for? Who is hell for? Well, in order to answer that question, let's take up our scriptures again. If you have your Bible with you, turn back to Mark 9. And we're going to read again verses 43 through 47. Mark 9, 43 through 47. We're going to read those verses again. Here Jesus says, And if your hand causes you to sin cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. So, What Jesus teaches us here is that hell is for those who say, nobody tells me what to do with my hands, I will do what I please. And nobody tells me what to do with my feet, I will go where I please. And nobody tells me what to do with my eyes, I will delight in what I choose. Hell then will be the destination for those who have insisted on doing as they please. Hell will be the ultimate destination for those who have rejected God's sovereignty over their lives. Hell is for those who have insisted upon declaring sovereign control over their lives and who have stubbornly and who have determinedly refused to bend the knee before God and His Son. You know, this afternoon, brothers and sisters, we're gathered together for instruction from the catechism. We're considering one of the articles that's part of the Apostles' Creed. It's the creed that believers have. But do you know that unbelievers also have a creed? It's a very short creed. It's very direct. It's very to the point. It's the kind of creed that would make catechism class a dream. But here is the unbeliever's creed. It's very simple. It goes like this. My life under my control. That's the unbeliever's creed. That's the unbeliever's catechism. My life under my control. Well, hell, hell will be the ultimate destination for all of those who have espoused that creed. So we know from God's word that hell is a reality. And we know from God's word that those who will be consigned to hell are those who who steadfastly reject the gospel and who refuse to be subject to King Jesus. But then the next question is this, what will hell be like? What will those who are consigned to hell, 
What will their experience of hell be like? Well, it turns out, brothers and sisters, that we can actually be quite specific here in answering that question. And we're able to be quite specific in answering this question because we are able to reflect on the experiences of someone who has literally been to hell and back. And that someone is our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord, who we confess in the Apostles' Creed, descended into hell. Now, it is worth pausing here for a moment. It's worth pausing here for a moment and noting that different Christian traditions have interpreted this article of the Creed in very different ways. For instance, there are those who who have argued that after Jesus died, that he literally and physically goes down to hell. And the suggestion is that while he is in hell, and usually what's set forth is that he's in hell for that three-day period that he is laying in the grave, that while he is in hell, that Jesus went and that he preached the gospel, and he preached the gospel to the, to the souls who were in Hades. Others have suggested that perhaps when we say that Jesus descended into hell, what we mean is that Jesus went down to hell and that he sort of literally kicked in the gates that he sort of showed up in front of the kingdom of heaven and kind of leans back and smashes through the gates. And this is a way of trumpeting, of, of proclaiming his victory. There are, however, some real difficulties with these particular interpretations. For instance, if it's true, if it's true that Jesus went to hell for three days after he died, how is it that he could possibly have turned to the thief who hung next to him on the cross? And, and how could he truthfully have said to that thief today? Today you will be with me in paradise. And if Jesus had to go to hell in order to proclaim the gospel to departed souls in Hades, how could he honestly have cried out about his own ministry? How could he have cried out on the cross, it is finished? Because it wouldn't have been. Consequently, the Reformed position has always been to reject such theories and and to say that they're irreconcilable with the Scriptures, And instead, to to say that when we confess that Jesus descended into hell, what we're confessing is that Jesus endured the torment of hell as he hung on the cross. And that in particular, he endured that torment of hell during those three hours of darkness that, that settled in as he hung there. Well, what do we know about Jesus' experiences during that time? What do we know about Jesus' experience of hell Well, what we know is that during that time, he endured the outpouring of God's wrath. That's what he was doing there. When Jesus hung upon that cross, he was enduring the outpouring of all of God's wrath against the sins of the entire world, against your sins, against my sins. It was God's wrath. It was the condemnation that Paul talks about in Romans 8. That is what he was enduring. And how was that wrath of God manifested. Well, it was manifested. It was manifested in the darkness. And it was manifested by an utter rejection of the Son by the Father. An utter and a total and a complete rejection of the Son by the Father. The true depth of hell then, it was the absolute isolation that Jesus endured. That's the reason for Jesus' agonized cry as he hangs on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the point is that as he calls that question out into the darkness, there's no response. There is no reply. As Jesus cried out into the darkness, silence and agony, those were the only experiences that he had. We need to understand that Jesus wasn't just cut off from God as he hung there. No, he was also cut off from his family. He was cut off from his disciples. He was cut off from his friends. Again, that's the significance of the darkness that descended as he hung on the cross. He was cut off as he hung there from all forms of communion. He had nowhere to turn. There was no one that could provide him comfort. There was no one to provide him solace. He was utterly rejected both by God and by man. And we confess elsewhere in the catechism that that the 
reason that this is so was because he was crucified and that he had to be crucified because he had to be cursed. He couldn't die in some other way. He had to die hanging upon that cross because it was only there that he was totally, completely, and utterly cut off from all communion as one who hung between heaven and earth as one who was cursed. So what can we learn then about the experiences of our Lord? Well, what we learn is that hell is not just a sphere of punishment. It is a condition of complete separation and a total absence of communion. It is, as it was for him, a place of outer darkness. As we meditate on the experience of our Lord as he hung on the cross, what we come to understand is that hell is a total separation from all of the relationships that give us our identity. Hell is a total separation from all of the relationships that give us our identity. And what we also know from our reading of Mark 9, 48, is that it is a place where the worm never dies. It's a place where the fires are never quenched, which means that it is an everlasting condition. Which means, brothers and sisters, that based on a consideration of Jesus' experience on the cross, we can say definitively, we can say conclusively, that there is not going to be a party. And it also means that hell is far, far more terrifying than perhaps even we have imagined. Because what if the true horror of hell is that you think you're the only one there? What if the true horror of hell is that you don't think there's anyone else enduring it with you? What if the true horror of hell is being surrounded by a dense and an ever-deepening darkness? A darkness that is so thick that it, it prohibits the experience of any kind of communion with either God or man. And what if over the course of an endless eternity... That darkness only gets deeper and those feelings of isolation only intensify. Can you imagine a darkness like that? A darkness so thick, a darkness so heavy that it presses down upon you. A darkness that is, is so divisive, so, so separating that, that as you scream out into it, as you cry out into it, you hear nothing but the anguished echoes of your own cries. And can you imagine that all hope, all hope of ever changing your circumstances has been lost? At this point, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that seems a little extreme. Who do you think you are there, Temple? Do you think you're Jonathan Edwards? Surely you've exaggerated things this afternoon. Surely you've exaggerated things simply for the sake of being dramatic. How could we, how could we really possibly conclude that, that hell is actually that bad? Well, first of all, that view of hell is one that's consistent with what Jesus says about hell. In Matthew 8 verse 12, the Lord says that hell is a place of outer darkness. Here we see again that reference to darkness just as he experienced as he hung on the cross. A darkness that was symbolic of his complete isolation. And it's noteworthy here that Je Jesus doesn't just call this darkness. He doesn't just say it's unpleasant. He just doesn't say it's dark. No, he says hell is outer darkness. And you think about that, right? You think about it like a circle. Something that's outer is at the edges. It's, it's a position then of being pushed of being thrown, of being cast out to the very edges. It's a position of separation. It isn't just darkness. It's outer darkness. A terrible darkness indeed. But let's think for a moment. Let's think for a moment, not just what we know about hell from the Scriptures, but let's think for a moment about what we know of heaven. And let's do that because it stands to reason that that whatever the experience of hell might be, it's got to be exactly the opposite 
of the experience of heaven. And what is it, brothers and sisters, that we know about heaven? Well, what we know about heaven is that heaven will be the experience of an eternal and of an ever-increasing sense of communion. And that's going to take place in two ways. In the first place, heaven will be an experience of an ever-deepening, of an ever-increasing sense of communion as day by day, year by year, millennia by millennia, the children of God are brought into ever-deeper fellowship with him. You know, one of the most beautiful pictures in, in all of the scriptures is the picture of Adam and Eve walking with God in the garden in the cool of the day. That's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? That Adam and Eve would be about their labors, they would be working in the garden, and as the day drew to a close, and they would hear that noise, that noise that alerted them to the fact that God was in the garden. And they would stop from their labors, and what would they do? They would, they would find the Lord, they would seek him out, and then they would walk together. They'd walk together and they would talk together and God would say, what have, you, what have you been doing in this world that I've made? How have you been laboring in my kingdom? Tell me about what you've been doing. You know, the amazing thing about our Savior Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, is that Jesus isn't just in the business of salvation. Jesus is in the business of restoration. And one of the things that Jesus is restoring, one of the things that he's bringing back is the cool of the day. Which means, loved ones, that when we get to heaven, we will enjoy that fellowship. We will enjoy that blessing again. Can you imagine that? Imagine yourself being in the new heaven and the new earth and you're busy about your labors. Maybe you're a painter and you've been painting a beautiful landscape. Maybe you've been a musician and you're hard at work crafting another hymn of praise for God. Maybe you're a builder and you've been busy laboring all day, or erecting a new, a new house, a new dwelling. Maybe you're a scholar and you've spent your day bent over the table studying the, the pages of God's Word, seeing them without the blinders of sin and being amazed by the riches that are there. But it's come to the end of the day. And you're just about to set down your, your pen, you're just about to set down your hammer and, and to take your ease. And you hear that sound, and you know, you know that Jesus is there. And you, you turn around, and there he is. There is your Lord. And seeing him, you, you fall to the ground, and you, you grab his feet, and you, you begin to worship him. And he reaches down, and he lifts you up, and he says, my child, come for a walk with me. Tell me about what you've been doing. Tell me about how you've been busy in my kingdom today. That is the business of restoration. That is the business of heaven. A deepening, constantly ever deepening sense of communion, of union, of closeness with the living God. And you know what's absolutely incredible about this? It's not just that it's good. It's going to be better than good. In fact, it will be better than it even was in Edom for Adam and Eve. Because when they were in the garden, they were walking and talking with the God who was their creator. But when we are in the new heavens and the new earth, and we are walking and talking with Jesus, we won't just be walking and talking with the one who made us. We'll be walking and talking with the one who redeemed us. The one who bought us back with his own blood. And so the richness of that fellowship will be far greater than anything that Adam and Eve enjoyed, even in their perfect state in the Garden of Eden. But even that's not the end of it. Because the reality is that, that heaven doesn't just involve a deepening communion with God, it's also going to involve coming into deeper and deeper communion with all of God's people. It will mean coming into deeper and deeper fellowship with every single one of God's children. I want you to imagine this. Imagine that you are standing in the streets of that new Jerusalem. Those golden streets. And maybe you and a, a group of your friends are, are standing at a street corner and you're, you're talking. You're talking about how you've been busy in God's kingdom that day. And then on the other side of the street, you see someone strolling by and he's wearing the robes of a prophet. 
And you say to your friends as the man strolls by, hey, does, does anybody know who that is? Do you, do you know who that guy is? And they say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's Jonah. And you think to yourself, Jonah? Whew, I got some questions for that guy. And you go over and you hustle after him and you, you, you tap him on the shoulder and Jonah stops and he turns around and, and you say, hi, I, I, I'm Jeff. And he says, I'm Jonah. And you say, I know. Three days and three nights inside the belly of a fish, eh? What was that like? And Jonah says, well, it got my attention. And you say, well, I bet it did. And Jonah says, yeah, but you know, the incredible thing about it is that God used that experience to turn my heart back towards him. I'd grown cold in my love for him. I didn't really want to serve him. I didn't want to go where he sent me. I didn't want to bring myself into conformity with his will. But he stuffed me inside that fish. And three days there really got my attention. And I started thinking about who he was and the need to serve him. And he was merciful to me and he turned my heart back. And you say, you know what? I, I think he worked in my life the same way. And Jonah says, were you stuck inside a fish? You say, no, 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 I, I was never in a fish, but I went through some dark times in my life, times where I didn't want to follow God, times where I didn't want to walk with him, and God kind of afflicted me, but, but he turned my heart back towards him, and, and I'm sure glad that he did. And the next thing you know, you and Jonah are in a conversation about, about how good God has been. And about how he's worked in your lives and how he's laid claim to you and how, how he brought you into fellowship with himself and how he rescued you. And, and the next thing you know, you're both rejoicing. Rejoicing in the goodness of God towards sinners. And here's the thing. You get to do that on Monday when you meet Jonah. And then on Tuesday, you meet Ruth. And on Wednesday, you meet Esther. And on Thursday, you meet Martin Luther. And on Friday, you meet some peasant girl who died in the year 1000 in the south of France, but who knew the Lord and had been walking with him. You get to do that over and over and over again with a great host of God's people. You know, loved ones, the reality is we do not think about heaven enough. We have been given a, a wondrous hope. We've been given a glorious hope. And we need to take that hope and we need to set that hope of heaven. We need to set it before our hearts. And we need to let that hope fill us and encourage us and strengthen us so that like Paul, we can run the race to the end and lay hold of that which Christ has obtained for us. We don't think about heaven nearly enough. But here's the thing, and this is the point. It stands to reason that the experience of hell, that it would be the reverse. That it would be the exact opposite of heaven. And if in heaven that time will be characterized by an ever-deepening sense of communion and inclusion, then it stands to reason that the experience of hell will involve the complete absence of all forms of communion. And that it will involve an eternally intensifying sense of isolation. And all of this, brothers and sisters, all of this means that what I should have done was to grab that young man. I should have laid hold of him. I should have pulled him aside and I should have said to him, but what if there's no party? What if hell is not a cavalcade of debauchery and rage? What if hell is an eternity of being completely cut off from any form of relationship at all? What I should have said to him is, what if hell is so, so much worse than you think it is? And let's be clear, brothers and sisters, this, this isn't just a, a message for other people. It's also a message that we need to be speaking to our own hearts. We need to be speaking to ourselves as a, as a way of, of keeping our own hearts faithful. Maybe you're here this afternoon and, and over the last little while you've been, you've been thinking to yourself, I'm not so sure about this church business. I'm not so sure that I wouldn't be better off without all the limitations that being a Christian puts on my life. Maybe if I got rid of Jesus, and maybe if I got rid of his people, I might be happier. 
maybe if I could jettison myself of this weight, I'd be in a position to, to enjoy a, a happier life. Maybe I'd be in a position to, to enjoy what it is that life has to offer. Well, if that's the way that you've been thinking, then you need to hear clearly and unequivocally this afternoon that there is no party. You've got to be aware of what hell really is, and you need to think long and hard about whether this is a trade that you're willing to make. Because here's the thing, while you might think that you are prepared to to live without Jesus in this life, the real question that you need to be asking yourself is this, am I prepared to live without Jesus in the next life? And this isn't just a message for our hearts, it's also a message for the world. It's a message that we have to proclaim. I'll admit, brothers and sisters, this is not a message that's going to make you popular. If you want to convince people that you have been let out on a day pass, go around telling them that you believe that Satan is real. Go around telling them that you believe hell is a real destination. It won't make you popular, it won't make you liked. But the simple truth is this, if we really love our neighbors, if we love them as we ought to and as we've been called to, then we need to be honest with them. We need to be honest with them about the reality of God's anger against sin. We need to be honest with them about the destination of everyone who refuses to be reconciled with Him. We need to be honest with them about the destination of everyone who's determined to do as they please. But we need to speak that message knowing that we also have an incredible message of hope. For even as we speak the truth that not only is hell real, and not only is it worse than you think it is, we must also proclaim the wonderful good news that there is a way of escape. And the means of escape from the darkness of hell is the name of Jesus. And he is the way of escape because he endured hell. He's the way of escape because he endured the full outpouring of God's wrath against the sins of the world. He's the way of escape because he offered himself in our place as an atoning sacrifice on the cross. Brothers and sisters, the amazing news of the gospel is that you don't need to go to hell because Jesus went there for you. And he's done so. He's done so. And now there is no anger left in the heart of God for repentant sinners. That's what Paul says in Romans 8 verse 1. There's no longer a need to live in fear of condemnation if you've repented from your sins. Because that wrath has been diverted against, away from you and poured out on Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the message that we're privileged to bring to the world is that although God is an angry God, And although he is justly outraged by our sin, and although those who endure the outpouring of his wrath will do so in hell, there is a means of escape. And that is because the grace of God is greater than his wrath. And so although there is not going to be a party in hell, there is most certainly going to be a banquet in heaven. And there is a seat at that table for every single person who has put their faith and their hope in Christ and Him crucified. Amen. We'll respond to the proclamation of God's Word.